feel the chill bumps. He could feel the anointing. He could feel the Spirit of God. And as soon as David would stop playing, he would take a spear and a javelin and try to thrust him through, try to kill him. It's the devil of hell trying to quench David's fire. Here's Saul's daughter. She's raised up under that kind of attitude, raised up in a home with that kind of spirit. She sees David worshiping God with all of his might, dancing before the ark with all of his might. And when he gets home, she had great contempt for him. She said, you pulled that robe off today, your king's robe, and you danced in your under tunic. Only a, a, a poor man, a beggar, would be found in his in the tunic that they wore underneath their robe. They considered it to be naked. It's what Peter had on when he saw Jesus standing on the shore. And he put his fisherman robe around him and jumped in and swam to the shore because he said, for he was naked. Didn't mean that he didn't have clothes on. Just had that tunic that they wore under their robe. David took his robe off and danced. Why? He was abasing himself. He that abases himself shall be exalted. But he that exalts himself shall be abased. David was saying, I'm nobody. The real king is coming behind me. Hallelujah to God. The real king is coming behind me. Don't look at me. Look at him. Don't reverence me. Honor him. Well, Saul's daughter, Michael, she said, you made a fool of yourself. She despised. David's worship. That word despised is a strong word. She despised the worship of God. She despised the moving of the Holy Ghost. And God said the reward for despising the Holy Ghost is you'll never bear fruit. You'll never produce life. There's no life outside of the Spirit of God. There's no anointing. There's no quickening power. There's no conviction. There's no transforming. There's no real change. You can go to church and just go through the motions and still be lost. Still be an addict. Still be hooked. Still be bound. Still be controlled by the devil. My God, what's the point in going to church if Jesus doesn't lord and rule my life? What's the point in praying if there's no power, if there's no deliverance, if there's, if there's no freedom? My God, whom the Son have made free is free indeed. But to the man or the woman that despises the Holy Ghost, there's no life. No life. I've read that text over and over and over again throughout the years. And I've asked her. I know she can't answer back. And I've asked her, Michael, if you could do it again. Would you have got in the street with him? And worshipped alongside of him? I would like to think that she would have. But I could ask some people that are still living in our generation today, if you can do it again, if you can have a do-over, if you could get yourself in the church, if you could fall in an altar of repentance and pray and seek God and experience Pentecostal power, would you do it? So far their answer is no. You can despise the Holy Spirit to your own hurt. To your own suffering. Michael harmed herself greatly. A person can also blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Jesus said all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies. Wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost 
hath neither forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Mark chapter 3 verses 28 and 29. The occasion on which Jesus spoke those words deserves our attention. Jesus is performing miracles. There were signs on every hand that he had demonstrated his deity, his authority, the fact that he was the Messiah and that he indeed was the Savior of all men, the Son of God. Yet men and women around him resisted and despised the miracles, the signs, the attributes. And not only resisted and despised, they attributed the work of God to the devil himself. They said, this man cast out devils by the power of Beelzebub. He's the king of devils. He's the chief of devils. That's the reason demons obey him. He is their king. He is their prince. My grandpa told a story. I won't even use the denomination lest somebody say I'm knocking on a denomination. Grandpa said he's pastoring a church. He was a church pioneer. They had started a church. Back then, Pentecost was brand new to this region, to this part of the country anyway. They were Pentecostal pioneers, much like the pastor is over in Jerusalem right now. When I say a Pentecostal pioneer, I mean they went to a city or a town where there was no Pentecostal church whatsoever. None. Zero. Pentecost was just being introduced. We know in the early 1900s at Azusa Street, it was being poured out. It started in California, but it took a while to make it to Alabama. Grandpa said in his part there was no Pentecostal church. He said five women. He said evangelists come through, brother. Uh, uh, I believe his name was Ori Bang is what Grandpa called him. But he was out of Orange, uh, Orange Grove, I think, over in Mississippi, right outside of Pascagoula, Moss Point. He would went up through there rode, riding on a horse. Made his way through there on a horse, throw up a brush harbor, preach. Men and women fall under conviction, get saved, stay there three, four, five, six, seven weeks, get them prayed through the Holy Ghost. He said when he left that region, had six women saved, six women filled with the Holy Ghost. He said one of them was my mama. He said he told them, I, I, I'm, you know, riding, making a circuit. The circuit riders, what they were, making this circuit, making my rounds. I'll come back through and on such and such day, if you haven't found a pastor, uh, you know, on, on such and such day, I'll be back through. We can have church. But in the meantime, you need to pray for God to give you a pastor. Grandpa was a, a pulp wooder working, you know, cutting trees. Said, got off work one evening. Walking by the church, my mom and four of the ladies in there, little wood frame building. He said, all you could hear was them praying, crying out to God, wailing, speaking in other tongues. He said, boy, for somebody ain't never heard it before, he said, I'm easing by there, almost scared to death. He said, I did that a few days. They're in there praying for God to give them a pastor. God, raise up a man. Preach to us. Be our pastor. He said after three or four days of easing by there, one evening I fell under such conviction. Knew I needed God. Thirty years old, walked in that back door, sat down on the back pew. He said they had their back turned to me. Kneeled down at the altar crying and Praying and moaning and groaning, speaking in tongues. He said, I put my head down. He said, the next thing I remembered, I was in the floor. He said, and five, six women around me in a circle pointing their finger at me, praying over me in the Holy Ghost, asking God to save me. 
He said, pull me up out of that floor. Led me down to that altar. Prayed me through. He said, when they knew I was good and born again. He said, one of them said, stay down there, boy. You need the Holy Ghost. He said, they prayed for me for a while longer. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. He said, mama patted me on the back and said, praise God. He got himself a preacher. He said, I couldn't even read. Didn't know how to read. Pulled him out of school early so he could work the fields with his dad. He said, but the Holy Ghost helped me read the Bible when I opened the Bible. He said, didn't know how to to hardly read or write, but no doubt God had used those women to thrust him into into the ministry. And so it went. I want to tell you, There was a time when people weren't open and receptive to Pentecost at all. At all. Brother Clendenin talks about one of the pastors that was ahead of him in Texas that he had great respect for. He said, when we started our church, it's a little brush harbor. He said, we cut down trees. Made posts, limbs and bushes, leaves for the top. He said, we'd meet Sundays there. He said, Brush Harbor's kind of close to the property line. Said the the neighbors got some little old small cord thread, tied it to to our Brush Harbor post that was holding the roof up. Waited till we all got under there. Waited till we got to singing, worshiping, and shouting. So they took them cords and pulled the post out from under one side, and the whole thing collapsed on top of us. We come crawling out from under the under the debris and said they were laughing at us. Didn't want a Pentecostal church in their county, in their city. He said we crawled out from under the under the debris he said I picked the song book up and said let us continue and he said we sang on next to the pile of debris and the Holy Ghost still fell still moved he said I've lived long enough now he said they don't pull the post out from under us anymore we made friends with them They're not uh, threatened by us anymore. Seems like the devil has put the fire out. God help us. Going back to our text, you can blaspheme. He that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost have neither forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation the Lord said in Genesis 6 and 3 my spirit shall not always strive with man because he has resisted despised and blasphemed the Holy Ghost when that man or that woman is then damned it is a very serious matter to resist Because if you're resisting the Holy Ghost, if you continue, it won't be long until you despise the moving of the Holy Ghost. And you're in very dangerous waters if you're despising the moving of the Holy Ghost, whether it be in the preacher, whether it be in the singer, the musician, or the prayer. If you're despising the move of the Holy Ghost, it won't be long until you'll be blaspheming the Holy Ghost saying that's the devil that's the devil making those people act that way it's the devil that's got them deceived when they attributed the power of God to the power of the devil Jesus said be very careful you can speak against God you can speak against the son of man but if you blaspheme this holy ghost He is the the convicting agent of God. 
That third person of the triune Godhead is the one that deals with your heart. He is the one that convicts convicts and convinces you of your sin. He is the one that gives you the desire to read your Bible, to pray and to go to church. And if you grieve Him out of your life, you're finished. I don't want to leave you there. Here's a remedy to it all. Heaven's preventive measure from quenching the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. In wisdom and in grace, God has taken great pain to prevent men and women from quenching the Spirit of God. Thank God for it. I said God has gone through great pain and measure to prevent men and women from quenching the Spirit of God. The secret is in the full declaration of the gospel which includes not only repentance toward God, not only faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, but also in appropriating the person and the work of the Holy Ghost in our life. One of the definitions of a genuine Christian is a spirit-filled man or woman. Brother Clendenin said it, and I, I'm in total agreement with him. He said the baptism of the Holy Ghost will produce a genuine Christian man or woman. He's not saying they weren't already a Christian. He's not saying they weren't already saved or born again. But he's saying the baptism of the Holy Ghost is God's fireproof method from him just being a religious man. It's God's fireproof method from uh, Him just getting uh, uh, lost in the ruts of religion. This thing becoming mechanical. Don't take this the wrong way. But when I say mechanical... See people that live wicked when they get in a place where they want it. Or you've seen sports figures live with the morals of a dog. It's just mechanicals, all it is. Holy Ghost. God's fireproof method. He won't allow that to happen. He forbids that to happen in your life. He's going to make sure you're sold out. Genuine. My God. If you're not, He's going to deal with you about it. Amen. No wonder the apostle said, be filled with the Spirit. Listen. A person who's truly repented of their sin, is prepared to live for Christ, number one, they should ask for the Holy Ghost. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You want to be filled? Ask Him! Lord, I want you to fill me. Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Let it be the all-consuming request of your life. You let a baby get hungry, they're going to cry until you give them a bottle. They're going to cry until you bring them a juice cup or a plate of food. You let a man or woman get hungry for the Holy Ghost. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. What does that mean? They're not going to stop until they're filled. They're not going to rest until they're filled. They're not going to come short without being filled. My God. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. It was in that... It was in that teaching 
of Luke chapter 11 where we find this text. In Luke 11 and 13, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Them that will not be denied. Ask. Seek. Knock. There is a progression there of not quitting, not giving up, of continuance. Once you ask, then you must receive. You are not a wind-up doll. You you are not a, a puppet string. You are a man or a woman. God has saved you. You, you are a free moral agent. You must ask, and if you ask, by faith, you must receive. When you ask the Lord to save you, you believed He would, you believed He did, and you left saved. Isn't that right? When you ask the Lord to fill you, you believe He will. You have to receive, just like you received your salvation. Acts 2 and 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Peter didn't preach a mutilated message. That was the, that was the gospel in a nutshell. He insisted that response to the presentation of his message to men And under women should include a turning to God, a trusting in Christ, and a receiving of the Holy Ghost. And then last, curse if you'll help us, I'm closing. We must ask, we must receive, then, then we must respect or reverence to the point of obedience. Respect or reverence Him to the point of obedience. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit. And as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God told in Acts 5 and 32 that God gave the Holy Ghost to them that obey Him. If you mean business with God, you're committed to yielding. Yielding to the Holy Ghost. Brother Tim used to always sing a chorus. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. What does that mean? You have to learn to yield to the Holy Ghost. Move with the Spirit of God. When you feel Him tugging your heartstrings, pray. When you feel Him getting your feet, stand up and love Him and worship Him. When you feel the unction to shout, then shout it out. My God. Woo! Hallelujah! Yield to the Spirit. Sometimes I think it comes in little increments. You're a babe in Christ and you're walking with God and you're desiring to be filled and you're desiring to live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. Holy Ghost tell you, clap them hands. You just feel so much joy in the Holy Ghost that you clap them hands. Woo! Hallelujah! I can remember a a babe in Christ sitting on the pew and Brother Tim be preaching. Holy Ghost, move on me. Lord, deal with me and say, shout Amen! I just feel like I was grieving him. Then one night, I couldn't take it no longer. Brother Tim was preaching. I said, Amen!
Woo! Hallelujah. What was God doing? He was just teaching me how to yield to Him. You see, when He fills you, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Listen to this. As the Spirit gave them the utterance, they spake. It was the Spirit that gave them the utterance. It wasn't the Spirit that spake. They spoke. But he moved on them, Brother Daniel. He moved in them. And he was giving them the words to speak. And they had to open their mouth and speak what God put in them. I'm not teaching you some kind of charismatic doctrine. You'll never hear me come up to you. Get in your ear and say, da, 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 da. No, 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 no. If I catch anybody doing that in our altars, I shut them down. If I hear about people going anywhere where somebody's taught them how to talk in tongues, I don't want them to go anymore. He gives the utterance, not the preacher. If I can teach you how to say it, it ain't the Holy Ghost. I am saying He moves on you to clap your hands. He moves on you to shout amen. He moves on you. He might move on you to run a lap around the building. We was in here in camp meeting years ago. Long time ago. Holy Ghost is a moving. Brother Homer's got a bad ankle. (laughs) Always kind of walked favoring that ankle. Holy Ghost moving one night. He took out. Run a lap around here. God. Somebody said, what is it? I said, Brother Homer's running. I know the Holy Ghost is in this place. He ain't no runner by nature. My God, if the Holy Ghost tells him to run, he'll run. My God, my God, my God. Hallelujah to God. That's what being filled with the Spirit is not just about running and jumping and speaking in tongues but you're going to be in the marketplace and the Lord's going to lay on your heart and he's going to say that person's hurting they're in need why don't you go talk to them why don't you go pray with them why don't you go tell them your story what I've done for you the, the speaking in tongues I see initial physical evidence That's the beginning of of yielding to God. Walking with God and being led by God. I can tell you ministry comes and is birthed out of and born out of. Obeying God. Shout up a whole and day. My God, I feel feel the Lord's talking to somebody right now. Being obedient. You want the Holy Ghost. Yield to Him. Yield to Him. Be obedient when He's moving on you. Do what He asks you to do. Halabahosiende. Mary told those men at the wedding feast in Cana, whatever that's, whatever He says for you to do, do it. That's how you get the water turned into wine. That's how you receive wine in a wedding. And that's how you receive the Holy Ghost in the altar. Whatever He says to do, do it. That's God's fireproof remedy from quenching the Holy Ghost. He's yielding to Him. Obeying Him. Hallelujah. You won't be in danger of blaspheming Him. But rather He'll pour out of your innermost being like rivers. Of living water. You know when I was a sinner. I worried about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. I've never worried about it again. Brother Joseph. Why? Because I live. To be obedient. To the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you're able stand with me tonight. I preached a little longer. Than what I wanted to. 
I'm telling you, I've been preaching some discipleship messages on Wednesday night. Christianity and you. Christianity in your life. I'll tell you, it's the simplest way to put it tonight. Quench not the Spirit. That's all I can tell you in a nutshell. It's the easiest way to live for God. Quench not the Spirit. Whatever He says for you to do, do it. He won't ever ask you to do anything that don't line up with the Word of God. He don't ask you to do things to show out or to make a circus sideshow. When He asks you to do something, it's for the greater good, not only yours, but somebody else's of the kingdom of God. He desires to show His glory through your life. Somebody else may have looked at Brother Homer running a lap around that building. Somebody was telling me they invited somebody to come to Bible Way. And they said, Bible Way. Is that the church out on 98? Just past 55? And they said, it is. He said, visited that church one time. He said, there's a tall, gray-headed man that sat on the front row. And while the preacher was preaching... They got to shouting and that big old tall gray-headed man got up and started running laps around that building speaking in tongues. And I got up and went out the back door and ain't never been back. Tear came to my eye. I said, Ray Coleman. Hallelujah. If you knew Ray Coleman, you'd know that was God, not him. you knew Brother Homer, you'd know it's God and not him. And not doing it so people say, look at me. I can run. Look at me. I can preach. Look at me. I can sing. It's God being glorified through the earth and vessel. Ah, God, don't you want your life to glorify God? Hallelujah. I know I do in mine. I want him to be glorified somehow, some way in my life. All I know to tell you is yield to Him. Quench not the Spirit. I want to invite you to this altar tonight. I want to, I want to ask you, amen, simply to yield to Him tonight. Simply to do what our text is teaching us to do tonight. Quench not the Spirit. Come talk to Jesus. Come pray. Come raise your hands. Love on Him. Amen. Worship Him. Praise Him. Be sensitive to it. Allow Him to move you and to stir you, to talk to you, to change you, to transform you. Lord, I'm here.